introduce and get this started. So welcome everybody to um, which um, TWED this is, if this is the second or third TWED of the fall 2017 term. Um, uh, we, it's a very packed semester in terms of TWED talks, the new uh, data idea seminars slash talks and RPI or users groups. We've got almost every week um, some Wednesday evening event. There's a couple Monday or Thursday events happening in IDEA. Check the check the schedule, which you'll find at tw.rpi.edu slash web slash TWED. We have an integrated schedule. Uh, tonight, we have a sort of a follow-up to the talk that Jim McCusker did a couple weeks ago. Sabir is going to be talking about uh, semantic data dictionaries and constructing knowledge graphs using semantic data dictionaries. We're excited because this is a uh, sort of a practice talk or or, or um, preview of talk of a talk he's going to be giving um, soon at Iswick. Uh, so just a, a logistical reminder, this talk is being streamed and recorded. Keep that in mind. You're welcome to ask questions, but keep it in Keep in mind that you are being recorded for a perpetuity. And without further ado, welcome, Sabir. Hello, everyone. I'm Sabir Rashid, and I'll be talking about the semantic data dictionary approach to data annotation and integration. So I'll be going over the motivation of this work and a short introduction um, before talking about some related work. Um, the related work falls in three main categories, and those are data integration, schema merging, and schema and semantic annotation. Um, then I'll go on to talk about some methods um, of creating semantic data dictionaries and querying them. Um, and then I'll discuss um, the evaluation of the automatic extraction of semantic data dictionaries um, that was done through web scraping techniques. Um, before concluding with some discussion on why this approach um, is a novel and possible solution to problems in um, the semantic merging and annotation fields. <coughs> so um, before talking about semantic data dictionaries, it's um, it makes sense to talk about what a standard data dictionary is. And um, from the Linares and um, Wigger's paper on data dictionaries from roughly 20 years ago, um, they defined a standard data dictionary as a controlled vocabulary containing information about database data. Um, and that information might include variable labels, descriptions, relationships to other data, and um, usage and origin. So standard the dictionary is useful for human readability, for a human to understand what is being described in the data. Um, but it's difficult for a machine to understand the meaning behind the data. Um, and therefore, data integration and schema merging tasks using standard data dictionaries are not easily automated. So in response, we provide the semantic data dictionary specification which um, allows the integration of data from multiple domains. And this is done by using a common metadata standard based on the semantic science integrated ontology, SIO, uh, which provides a high level domain agnostic conceptualization of scientific data. Um, furthermore, rather than just using a general ontology, the semantic data dictionary specification allows you to use more domain relevant ontologies um, in order to um, leverage more specific terminology. So such a semantic data dictionary specification will help with this um, curation and search of data. And it allows for the creation of compositional classes to describe data set columns rather than needing one to one methods. So the reason for introducing the semantic data dictionary specification is to address the challenge of finding data across databases with the same semantic meaning. 
And the reason this is challenging is because data columns don't necessarily reveal the meaning behind the data. And one-to-one -one mappings between columns and ontological classes are not readily available. So a single row of data um, in a database may include information about multiple um, entities. For example, you might have a row that has the subject's ID, their blood sample, um, maybe some metal concentration in that blood sample, as well as demographic information about the study. Um, furthermore, it might have information about a subject's um, parent, for example, whether a mother smoked during pregnancy, um, if birth outcomes are relevant. Um, so in a single row of data, there's explicit entities, but there's also implicit entities. And um, I'll be talking about actual columns in the semantic data dictionary specification for these explicit entities and virtual columns for implicit entities described in the data that's not necessarily specified. So the semantic data dictionary facilitates finding data that are relevant for um, comparison. So this is done by understanding that a data row um, may have separate but related entities and in understanding how these entities may be related to each other. And this is entities within a single row and relations between data columns. So the intent of creating a semantic data dictionary specification um, is to create a process that is more accessible by people who aren't necessarily familiar with ontologies. And the way we do that is by using a, this common metadata standard, the SIO ontology, as well as um, a limited number of domain ontologies. So by limiting the amount of ontologies we're using to create these semantic data dictionaries, um, it makes it easier for someone who's not as familiar with the semantic web to create semantic data dictionaries because there's less ontologies to learn. So um, next I'll talk a little bit about some related work. So first of all, we have data integration, which is the ability to unite data from multiple um, sources in such a way that we have a unified view of the data. And this data integration task, the use of ontologies um, to annotate data is increasing. However, this increase in the number of ontologies um, used for data integration results in an increase in the number of existing ontologies, which makes it difficult to decide which ontologies to use or possible interoperability issues. In an example of ontologies that facilitates data integration in the biomedical domain are the OBO or Open Biomedical Ontologies Foundry, um, which includes some well-known ontologies such as the gene ontology, KEBI for chemical entities, and the human disease ontology. So here's a low-res graphic of um, what data integration looks like. So you have a bunch of databases bases, and you want to merge them into a combined database that doesn't distort the meaning of any one individual file. So the third related background is um, schema merging, which is an approach to integrate information from multiple data sets. And this is done by trying to align the columns in or values in a data set schema to see which elements match with um, elements in a different schema. So um, two general methods used for schema merging is the use of tools to alter multiple schemas to be consistent. So if you have three or four schemas, then you'd alter each of those schemas in such a way that columns that correspond to the same concept have the same label in each of those schemas. And the other approach is to use these multiple schemas to create one merged schema. So um, in McBrien and philosopher Paulo Vassilis's work on schema merging, um, they mentioned several considerations 
including the possible intersection or union of schema elements, generalization of attributes in the schema, and removal of redundant attributes or relationships. Um, other methods use crowdsourcing for schema merging, like CrowdMap, um, where they reduce complex alignment problems into individual tasks that they then publish online and let um, pretty much a user base which they pay some amount of money to then annotate these schemas for them to see which elements correspond. However, this um, task of schema merging um, has an important problem associated, and that is how should corresponding elements in each schema be aligned? Uh, finally, um, this set of related work, this um, semantic data dictionary specification is most closely related to is the idea of semantic annotation. And there's several um, annotation platforms which are relatively effective. So um, before I go into those, semantic annotation um, as defined by Karyov in a paper on, in a survey paper related to semantic annotation frameworks is a practice of assigning metadata descriptions that describe information about entities in a data set or text. So this talk is more on semantic in annotation of databases, but semantic annotation also refers to the annotation of unstructured text um, with what concepts they correspond to. So three um, well-known annotation platforms are Muse, Armadillo, and Kim. Um, so Muse is an uh, information extraction system that performs ent entity recognition, and it does this by using um, creating tokens, doing cement sentence splitting, using part of speech taggers, and then tagging each part of speech with the semantic concept. Um, Armadillo is a platform for web scraping, so something like Beautiful Soup, but it has an interface that you can use, and it tries to do um, annotation for you. And then finally, Kim is a semantic annotator annotator which does both information extraction and then assigns um, the extraction concepts um, relative terms by using a supporting ontology. So um, this is what the KIM architecture or knowledge information management, knowledge and information management architecture looks like. So they have a front end browser um, as well as custom applications and it pretty much collects, its background knowledge is um, news articles, which it uses to create kind of this stored database that is the Kim ontology and knowledge base. And from that database, so in order to put the extracted information um, into that database from newspaper articles. Um, it does, like, um, like Armadillo, it does some tokenizing to then do, to split the sentence into the corresponding terms and then try to annotate that. Um, and in order to do that, it leverages an ontology. So, All right, so that was the related work where I talked about data integration, um, schema merging, and semantic annotation. So now I'll discuss our approach to semantic annotation, which is the semantic data dictionary specification. And it, the SDD specification is a way to represent implicit entities and re their relationships by leveraging domain specific ontologies where necessary, as well as a general ontology. Um, and namely, we're using the semantic science integrated ontology. So SIO provides a high level conceptualization of data. It has a three entity worldview. So everything in SIO is separated into objects, events, and processes. 
Um, SI also includes general properties to describe the relationship between entities, as well as measured characteristics, which are represented as attributes of those entities. So on top of using a general ontology like SIO, you may need to annotate your data with more domain specific terms. So the semantic data dictionary specification allows you to also use domain specific ontologies. Um, in our work with creating STDs, we've used domain specific ontologies such as SHARE, the Ch Children's Health Exposure Analysis Resource, KEBI for Analyze and Biomarkers, and Uberog for um, in a comical terms such as liver or heart. Right, so um, what the semantic data dictionary specification contains um, is, is pretty much a table which has for each data column, it describes the entities, attributes, time points, roles, relationships, and provenance around that column. And it conveys this information in a way that's both human readable and machine readable, as well as unambiguous. So um, this is a kind of collapsed down table of what the semantic data dictionary specification is. The paper contains a more expanded table, but um, the basic idea is we have a table which has these columns, which is pretty much um, what we usually refer to as a semantic data dictionary. And for each data set, for each column in a data set, we try to um, put, label each of these columns where possible. So for example, for a column that might correspond to um, a child's BMI, we might give that um, attribute associated with that column chair BMI, and it'd be the attribute of some virtual object, which is the child. And I'll show you example semantic data dictionaries, which might better clarify this. We also capture provenance information in the semantic data dictionary, such as how a certain column was generated meaning which activity produced that value, as well as um, how it was derived. So for example, BMI is derived from a person's weight and their height, using a certain relationship. So here's an example of actual columns um, in a semantic data dictionary. And um, this example comes from work we were doing um, in chair. So so you might have things like a unique identifier, which is um, for the parsing STD parsing script I'm using is a requirement, but not all STD parsers have that as a requirement, but it's something to um, uniquely create a URI for this KB entry we're creating. And then for each other column, you um, pretty much break down what it's talking about. So race is in this data set, we're using the mother's race and um, age is the mother's age. And so these are pretty much attributes of the mother that we've annotated and we've also included what their units are and um, when these, the time or when the measurement was taken. So are you discovering the attribute of you know, the, the information for that from the original data dictionary or the data set itself? How do you, um, how do you discover that concept that, that needs to be asserted in that way? Right, so usually associated with publicly available data sets is some sort of data description, which um, is, is like a data dictionary in a way where it describes um, what data columns are in a data set and what they pertain to. So 
um, for the data sets we've worked with, we've had that data description available. So we've used that to create these semantic data dictionaries, as well as um, for the NHANES um, data set, which we created a semantic data dictionary course. For all that, all those data descriptions are publicly available online. So um, we use the web scraping technique to um, go through those descriptions and populate parts of the semantic mm -hmm. data dictionaries based on what descriptions were. So, so I guess what, you know, to, to sum up what I'm suggesting you be clear on is in putting, in assembling a, uh, a semantic data dictionary such as this example, maybe specifically to this example, what sources of meta information do you need to or are required for this? Okay, that can include uh, you know, one or more other data dictionaries, data descriptions, domain knowledge, mm -hmm. if you just know it. Right. Okay. Um, so it, 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 it's important to be able to say what is the sort of what goes into doing this, because otherwise it's magic. Right. Okay. So as well as actual columns, which are used to describe the variables in a data set, we also have virtual columns, which are implicit entities in the data set. So um, in the previous example, we saw that we had um, attributes, which are attribute of a child and a mother, um, as well as this lead concentration. Um, so we use the virtual ent entries in semantic data dictionaries to clarify what those things are talking about. So for example, a mother is a chair mother. It, well, a mother is a human which has the role of being a mother in relation to some child object. Similarly, the child is a human which has the role of being a child in relation to the mother. Also, um, for these lead concentrations, we can see that this describes where, what that lead concentration is a part of. So for example, that lead it might be a part of some sample, such as a urine sample or a blood sample that was taken from the child or mother. So for each of this, so go back to the previous, I'm sorry. So for, for when we, when we see that one, so for each of those attribute of where you're using sort of that variable nomenclature, we would expect to see a virtual, um, right. a so virtual we, column defined mm -hmm. with, with more, more refined. Right. So, so any variable entry or virtual entry, which has these question mark, question mark in front of their name, um, they have to be defined as a virtual column. Okay, so we see that, so you, you go on. And so ultimately we should. Yeah, these are more rows, and to make that really, really clear. More rows the same table. Right. Yeah, just additional rows. Mm -hmm. Are they on the same table? Could you see what's required in the Right, so um, these are the columns in semantic data dictionary specification. And the actual columns, I only included a few of those columns. And for the virtual columns, I included another few of those columns. Um, but they are both part of the same table. And not all the columns have to be filled in for an actual entry or a virtual entry. So, so what's the so the virtual column allows us to describe entities that are implicitly described in the data without, that may not necessarily have a column associated with it. This is the main end example. Again, it's identified by an attribute of a thing, right? Yeah. That are um, identified the attribute of or the time point or um, it could be identified by how um, the class was generated. Okay. So any of those can be virtual entries. So, so, so here we have a variable, right? So I'm assuming that there is an instance of the child, some data about the instance of the child, which is the child. So then, for example, you can attribute that first. And how do you decide it's a virtual problem? Is it you decided or somebody has to? Well, so 
when I'm creating a semantic data dictionary, what I do is um, I create rows for each of the actual columns that are in the data set, and then I begin annotating them. And um, as I'm annotating them, um, it's kind of like a kind of philosophical or existential way of thinking like, oh, um, what what is meant by this data column? What is, um, what other entities are also described in this but aren't explicitly stated? So if there, if I need to include an entity which isn't already one of the other columns, um, that's kind of a hint that, oh, I need to create a virtual, um, a virtual entry in order to completely describe this actual language. So, so that takes care of data which comes, okay. data which changes over time, for example, which is not part of the schema, which is defined by the new category which is on the data. So, um, an instance of such data. Right, so, so data which um, changes over time, those individual time points can be captured by the time column, and you can create a virtual um, entry for each of those individual time points. But this is an active research um, direction that a lot of the people working on Habitat are working on, where they have abstract times, um, such as visit one, visit two, in actual times, which are, which may be dates things like that. So um, right now, um, in my script to parse semantic data dictionaries, I'm just treating time as a virtual entry and doing the same thing I would with any other virtual entry. But um, you can go further and handle abstract and actual time. Differences. So time points can actually be values in the data. Yes. So I'd recommend you just keep your own in there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right, so as well as a semantic data dictionary to describe the um, data columns, we also include a code book which describes the possible values of a certain data column. Right, so um, in this, the semantic data dictionary code book is very similar to code books that have been used in um, biomedical and other domains. Um, with the key distinction being that we also add this class column where we can map a each possible value to an existing class in the anthology. Right, so um, in this example, um, this is from kind of extending this chair semantic data dictionary. Um, the three of the columns were race, EDU and smoke. And race um, has, in this example, three possible values, zero, one, or two, which correspond to whether the person was Caucasian, black, or some other race. Um, similarly, they have three categories for education, whether they attended high school, um, some college, or if they're a college graduate. And then um, two variable values for whether or not they smoked during pregnancy. Right. So in this um, SED codebook, it's required to have either a label or a class, but you don't necessarily have, need to have both. So um, if you don't know what class maps to a certain possible value, then um, the extractor just assigns the label to it. That's possible value with a certain label. Um, but typically, if we do know the class, then we can query by that class as well in terms of which data entries have a value corresponding to high school or less. So if you were working off of an existing data dictionary, which I hope that you almost always have content for the label, I would think. Yeah, you'd, you'd almost always have these three. So um, going from a traditional code, for example, NHANES has code books. And it, it gives you these three for free, you know? Um, so going from a traditional code book to a semantic data dictionary code book um, is just pretty much assigning classes to each possible. 
which is a lot less work than yeah. Days. So you really need to distinguish that you expect to get values in columns one, two, and three. I mean that's typical that we see that, and then we're typical, yeah. uh, we're populating the last column, and we're calling that class, but in reality, these really many of them look like individuals. No, well, no, white is not an individual. That is you know, white race. Well, that's no, so of white is a subclass of race. Okay. Um, and so what you have is a, so these are all generally uh, subclasses of of sio quality, okay. and so you have something like sio race, which has subclasses white, black, or African American, Asian, and so forth and so on. And when you have when you instantiate a quality, it is of type. Sio race and white, or Sio race and black or African American, and so that is that's the quality, and it has a type, and it might have a label associated with it too. So you have I already this label of black or whatever they have in the original, but the idea is that the type the quality is it's the type that that is the type. So it's always class. Okay. So the, the value is one and a, the value is one and the is of type cheer smoker. Uh, that, it is a, that data. I, I guess you can add it has an already best label of some smoking Well, that's okay. interesting. So the value is an integer and it's a type well, smoker. It, well, actually, it might be like well, it might be a factor. factor. It might, yeah, it's not well, necessarily an integer, but that's. But that's yeah, we, there, we can. Yeah, we, we, we don't need it. We need a story. Well, I don't need, well so that the code the, the code value is just is prominence related. So maybe we don't want to make it too prominent in what we're having because it's there as a basically a backup saying, hey, this is why we're interpreting it this way. So if it's if SIO has value that might be too too pushy for it. Uh, we well, wherever we have this written up in the paper, we need to go back and revisit this because we're not doing the job right now. Well, well, so, <laughs> well, no, so, so, right? so is... Deb makes a very good point. We, we are not the first people to amplify codified values. Right. Okay, so we, so I, I think this is, I think there's a very clear answer to this. Yeah, in fact, in, I, I did exactly this process in the uh, paper in 20. Mm -hmm. so, uh, data Which is neat. Just, just saying that you check the clash. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. right. So, an additional table we use um, for convenience more than anything else is this code mapping table, which allows us to put a certain code. In the semantic data dictionary, if we don't know what class of This next diagram is kind of a flow chart or a flow diagram of how semantic data dictionaries and code books are used to create a knowledge graph. So essentially we start with the raw data. So three public data bases that we're using are NHANES, GDC, and MIMIC. And each of those databases have some sort of data description which describes which columns they contain and what each of those columns pertain. Or data di descriptions could even be data dictionaries that these data sets already have or code books that these data sets already have. So we use these data dis descriptions to create the semantic data dictionary or the semantic code book um, as I described. And then the semantic data dictionary is parsed to create template classes 
And those template classes, along with the data in the code book, are used to create knowledge graph data instances. I'd love to see this way up front. I'd love to see this, this in beginning. There's something like this contextualizing the talk. Yeah. yeah, right. Because actually, John's point earlier of we need to tell them what we're getting, what we're adding, so that they think it's magic. Mm -hmm. But like, you're not the only person in the world who can do it. Um, <laughs> yeah, and actually, you're going to have to do the best the way it worked because you took uh, 14, it was 614 time. Uh, got off of the work. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think that's going to have to come later. So what's the big, you know, what's the problem? What are you doing? This helps describe the problem. And that's mm -hmm. got to be like the first thing you mm -hmm. talk about. It. So, right. So but you are going to have to contextualize it. Because you are going to have to come up with different chances. Mm -hmm. well, this is a, just a wonderful diagram. that this sets, you know, I, I need to make sure that it's accurate. Mm -hmm. yeah, we're using SME power a lot here. I'm not sure. I, I think we might be using it your script, yeah, follow yeah, my script. Yeah, stop it. Oh. Yeah, I, I need to come up with a name for my script. So that's okay. <laughs> several several notes regarding something yeah. like this is a good way to introduce. Yeah. So, also the arrows. Um, you know, I'm trying difficult. Like, I'm finding it difficult to figure out. Like, you know, okay, so you go from code book to SDB to all to KG data instances. Is that how I'm supposed to interpret it? So you have the the raw well, data and the data description. So you, you go from the raw data and data description to create um, the SDD and code book. And then you use the um, SDD to create these template classes, um, which are pretty much folder classes for which for the knowledge graph instances you're going to create mm -hmm. without the SIO has value associated with it. Okay, where so the SIO has value corresponds to what's actually in the data. What do you mean by classes? I mean, they're like templates that... They're essentially template classes that don't actually have any data value associated with it, but it has the semantic structure of that class. So that template class would have um, which corresponding attribute or are you talking about the metadata class that my script creates? Or are you talking about something else? Essentially, the met well, so both so my script creates that too. Um, so, so I'm using that idea of create metadata classes first and then use those classes to create the um, instance, the actual data graph. Okay, I think that's going to be really hard to explain. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you can talk about generating metadata and then generating templates from, or generating data templates from the uh, SDD. Mm -hmm. um, but calling them template classes, that's really blurring the line between OWL classes mm -hmm. and, data, and data templates. And you're you're going to get a lot of questions about what you mean by, by blending it like that. Well, and is and template is it, class adding any value here? I'm certainly adding some confusion. It is, yeah. Is it adding value? I'm not sure. Right. I think that, if it's adding value, you need to articulate what right. value is. But I think you can just call them templates. Okay. Uh, stick with that. And the data description, is that a data dictionary and a code book? Yeah, it could be. And then this codebook that's in bigger font, that's really like an annotated codebook or an right. or, or something like that. Well, so, so the, the SDD, the Semantic Data Dictionary, is the dictionary mapping the codebook, the time points, and the, uh, and the, the, code, the code mappings. Mm -hmm. That's all the Semantic Data Dictionary. Mm -hmm. That first table you showed is part of the Semantic Data Dictionary. It's right. the dictionary mapping. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the if you're going to break it out, you need to be clear about that because you're talking about SDDs as if it's one thing, and then later on you talk about it being something else that's part of itself. So, so there's a there's another diagram which is perhaps a better contextualizing diagram for the very beginning, which is you, you talk about the sources, you know, the different, all different. It's it's like that famous diagram that we created 
a long time ago to be specific on how the creation thing. You've got sources, okay? Mm -hmm. You've got this this creation process, and the sources are a data dictionary, a code book, and or a data description, which you defined earlier as a separate thing. Right? Um, there's the, the mill, which creates this is a smart person. Right? Yeah. Well, the, yeah, the, it or could be smart domain expert. The domain expert, the, the not an ontology engineer person. Right. And then there are the several different SDB artifacts that are created. Right. So, uh, so under SDB, there are these very specific things that create it. So it's like things, arrows, smart person, yeah. and then, but creating a table or two, and these things that they create. Right. And so, that would say, like, right. right. So maybe you have a picture of the components of this maybe they didn't. Right. Yeah, I think right. you say it in text, but this I find confusing because it looks like we are somehow creating a code book, but yet we're creating it. Yeah. And it looks like that's separate from the SDB. I think that the one thing that's important here to, to show or to emphasize is that this is a process that's doable by a domain expert, not an ontologist. Yes. yes. That is, that's the essential, that's why SDBs exist. That's why we need the specification. It's like a, it's the primary motivating factor for this whole effort. Which was motivated by that process. Right, I'm going to use that process in the product. I mean, basically, I'm going to use that slide and your your slide because I view the next generation. But the, the whole value of that was it's, it allowed a real person. To it allowed epidemiology students to be productive as content right. creators and to review it as well. That's right. But so for for, the, for this, the same thing you want to do the same with your data and. Having them write settler scripts was not was a non-starter, and we needed something much more high, higher level. Mm -hmm. And so that needs to be the emphasis that this is a, a a biased, opinionated way to create data. So no, that's this is this is a this is a term of art in in programming. So uh, we know it's from Alex's presentation. Yeah. yeah. So it's. You, know, you, you are starting from a particular perspective about how to do things, and your that perspective helps you be more productive because it eliminates a number of choices that you have to make right up front. Right, and actually, Sabir earlier in one of my comments is you made a big point that you were helping people be productive by limiting the number of ontologies, and I don't think that's the main I'm, thing. I'm, so I'm conscious that yeah, on the one hand, we want to have this discussion, but on the other hand, I want to give him the favor of letting him. Yeah, he's not even enough for Yeah, so well, I'm sure he's got. Well, the the last couple of slides are after the references. Oh, good. Okay. So why don't you why don't you continue on and look forward to some important conversation? All right. So um. So some magic happens, and you <laughs> you, <laughs> and um, the end result is you have a knowledge graph. So, what does the knowledge graph actually look like? Well, it's just a collection of RDF entries or tuples where um, each entry is associated, is, is given a type based on what attribute it was assigned or if it was a virtual entry based on the entity. Um, and then you saw this attribute of was pointing to some virtual entry who in this case is Joe and the weight they have is three kilograms, so Joe must be a baby. Um, and this exists at um, chair birth, which um, corresponds to day zero in relation to some virtual birth event. Um, an example knowledge graph entry for NHANES, for an analyte um, in NHANES or a metal, um, is that that metal entity is a whatever heavy metal it corresponds to. I think this is a paraffin. Um, and also, so this is also a subclass of this NHANES KB ENXVUP, right? 
so, so what is this? This is actually the template class I was referring to. So each instance that gets created, um, so this is that um, butyl paraben for um, patient number 36512. Each of those instances are um, a subclass of the, or, or an instantiation of both the corresponding entity as well as this template concept. Ian, important to emphasize that ENXPUP is a subclass of KEBI 885422 because that's actually, that's what makes it important. This is a, basically it's KEBI 885422 in this data set. Right, yeah. So, so that's the, th that's why that's there. So mm -hmm. it's not the same template. It's, it's basically a metadata oriented class that lets you look at the data set specifically. So um, this example is also a good example of how we would annotate some lab, some concentration of metal or an analyte in a sample, um, because inherently that metal in the blood is a concentration or the, the value recorded in the data set is a concentration in units of, in this case, micrograms per deciliter. So um, that value in the data set, we don't annotate that as the entity, but we record that as a concentration of that entity in some sample. So it seems like it would be helpful, for, and perhaps in a couple other places, if you had Here's the data as it appears in the data set. Here's the challenge we have. You know, these are these are our columns. This is how we. This is the SDB. These are the SDB artifacts which are which we create in order to do this annotation. And this is the end result. I've kind of like worked all the way through. So that and, and to carry, you don't have to have it all in a, a row, but like this is the challenge we face. We've got to annotate based on this. This data coming in. What do we do? What are our sources? And then go through that. And also, don't get lost in the weeds. It's, you're going to kill yourself if you try to you know, see reference all of this. Detail. Yeah, and well, you're not going to have time to do it, but you might actually have like a, a little pop up or something on what we're adding here. You know, what, what do you want your audience to know about this slot? We added some annotations. And you can say just say things like we got we got the type from. Uh, from the attribute column, we got uh, what it's connected to from attribute of the unit is obviously from the unit, uh, uh, the unit column, and the value is actually the same. Because I think actually this is somewhat more intuitive. This is yeah, fun. yeah. This was much more straightforward. Yeah. So I was going to say maybe stick to one example, so you yeah, have yeah. the chia yeah. and then the kb thing. Yeah, so, so, I, so I included NHANES because um, I have some example queries based on NHANES. Yeah, they're going to be even more complicated. Um, but so, just to show you what this is. Yeah. Um, what are the type of I mean, for somebody who knows nothing about this, I just would assume this is just another idea. Set up already to keep this. Why is it? It's how we got it. Well, and so that's a point that yeah. you don't have epidemiologists having to write this, that it's automatically generated from the mm -hmm. So this is valid RDF that gets generated from that table that we're creating. Oh, so, so that so allows someone who's not well versed in the semantic web to actually create these knowledge graphs in a way that. Um, is well formatted. So, so I so it's, you might just have to say that like somebody who doesn't have any data, I mean somebody who doesn't know to make RDF might, might find it difficult, but because they're able to use this tool, here are the RDF which gives you some results, interesting results that you can do. This that's exactly it. this is the depth of CSV the RDF reality. Oh, okay. It's trying to put it's trying to put Tim RDF out of the job. Is what he's trying to do. Which team would be happy with? Well, yeah, and he's actually he's trying to put a whole room full of ISW this week. 
And most of them are going to be about that too. <laughs> right. So why why are we even putting data into this knowledge graph? Um, aside from this data integration task. And another answer is because it allows for the easy querying, easy based on your knowledge of Sparkle, of um, specific concepts in the data. And this is an example of the, an, a query that might be given to NHANES where we're selecting um, the subject, their ID, their cohort, their age, the age they were diagnosed with breast cancer, their survey weight, sex, socioeconomic status, BMI, and then um, two metal concentration or a single metal concentration value here, um, as well as whether or not they smoke or drink. Um, and the query pretty much can be broken down into pretty much a bunch of optional blocks which correspond to each column that is returned as well as the main block. So, so the main, th this is what I'm calling the subject query because I'm querying by subjects in the data set. So what I need for this query, what's required is that a subject has a role um, that's a SIO subject role and it has some identifier with uh, ID value. And then everything else is optional. So what we see here are a list of the subject year arise that was extracted from NHANES, their ID value, um, which cohort in the ones strung up here are from 1999, what their age was. Um, we see NA for age BC for a lot of them, except for, for example, these two is because these patients weren't necessarily diagnosed with breast cancer, but these two were when they were 63. Um, also, if you, if you actually look here, you see that um, some of these subjects are being repeated. So it, it is very important how you create the query as to getting the correct amount of results. So if I counted all these results, I might get more than the actual amount of results because um, these are we shouldn't have to go into these kind of steps. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the reason I the reason I mentioned this though is because um, that message you sent that the idea students were getting a different number of diabetes patients than what Alex had. I think that's this is why. Oh, we have, good point. Wait, so you're you're saying yeah, that's a good point. It could be just they what? they they didn't summarize. Right, but so this is, this actually good. isn't part of the talk, but I wanted to bring. Yeah, it that, up. no, he was answering the question, so much appreciated. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, thank you, thank you, but move on. Um, right. So, um, what's cool about this is then these different variables, which were originally part of this of separate tables in Enhance, now we can see as one big table, one integrated. So that's good, the integrated table, yeah. so, but, um, but also what does that allow you to do? So I think, so the big point of this is this whole semi-analytics or, or knowledge-driven analytics. That's that's what this ultimately is in ALO. So mm -hmm. I mean, this is more of an answer to why it's semantifying. Because if, if I was a if I was a relational database nerd, I'm looking at this like, so you you just spent an hour telling me how to get what I had already. Yeah, you just told me how to do a join. Right. So, right. but so, but the important, but it's the, the the important thing. The reason why you would show an example of the Spark query or even mention it is, you've got this. Um, you're driving your line of inquiry based on your, these domain ontologies that you. Which well, so, so the thing is, I think for probably ninety nine percent of the people who are going to be at the. Lean science or whatever it's called now, Lean science talk, the, the uh, uh, workshop. Once you show that there's real RDF data that's being generated from these from these template from these STDs, they know this is possible. Mm -hmm. You know, you basically hooked into their world and have blown up the possibility of what they can. Well, you probably made your point very early on. You know, for, yeah. for the people in there. You probably don't even need to go to this level 
Yeah, so, so, um, so you can say, here's, you can even just show like a screenshot of this table and say, here's an example of how I, uh, I was able to, to, uh, to grab, um, grab data across a whole bunch of entities tables without really thinking about where they came from. Right, yeah, that, that's, that's a good the point. point. Like that. Right, and it lets you, in this case, get some more global perspective uh, for us to answer the questions and it would have been hard and time consuming for an individual. Right. That, but that, that's like a minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not, a screenshot makes more sense than a lot of demo yeah. because mm -hmm. I might not even be able to access this. Well, it's, well, so it's not just screenshot, it's, it's, um, it's the point. Yeah, it's the take home message. Right. Why do I care? Right. And that's that's the real thing. Make and it's sure not you... just getting the, the global integrated uh, take home. That's good. But then what does it let you do? Mm -hmm. yeah. So basically, the, the, uh, the take home message is that domain scientists can produce high quality integrated RDF from their scientific data without a whole lot of help. And Basically, everything else that you talk about should either be explaining how that works or to their satisfaction uh, or uh, kind of, you know, proving that the, the you know, kind of uh, proving that this is real. This shows that yeah. it's real. Just this, just this right here. Well, that was actually, yeah. Well, work. yeah. So that was actually the second part when, while you were saying the first part, I was saying the second part is. That what they would be wondering is it is it for real? You know, so the first part is does it really enable domain uh, scientists and not semantic nerds to do this work? And we've done that and, a few times yeah, in and, multiple projects. And the, but the second point is it is it uh, is it for real in terms of the, the richness of the, of the geolization of real associated yeah. ecologies to do that annotation and is that yeah. exactly is and it that, actually high quality? That, and to the people in this audience, that's all they want to hear. Right. And is it effectively doing the integration? So that's the quality. Right. Yeah. I mean, and that's the real magic as well. It's not just about a bunch of enhanced tables. And that's one example is enhanced tables, but it's it's data from different sources that are significantly integrated, which is a point that you make early on. And when you go into the background, you do touch on that about this notion of combining data sets based on the same. The prior art uh, combines data sets based on um, recognizing that certain columns are similar. Well, this is the power of, of semantically similar based integration and, and using the, um, the clarity of these authoritative ontologies to do that. So that's, that's I, I think we're still in slides. Yeah, yeah, but they're really short. Yeah. So, okay, well, and what were you going to say here? So, so I was just because she's taking notes on what you say here. <laughs> so this semantic annotation using the STD specification is part of a larger semantalytics framework, which leverages semantics to perform analytics. And it's actually this piece over here where we're taking public data sets or biomedical databases and doing this semantic um, ETL essentially to create these knowledge graphs, which then can be used to do inference or knowledge derivation, which can power a semantic browser, which could be used to visualize the data or answer questions and hypotheses around the data, which will ultimately be used by end users such as clinicians, patients, or researchers. Just to kind of tie it into the big picture. So I would so using the term like semantic browser, that's um that could be a talk into itself. Yeah. Because you I think when you put that on there, you had something very general. That was, general that yeah, what that do you was mean Chris, well that's Kristen's word. I never I didn't put that back. This is one reason why I'm asking for more than just the paragraph. So that every blog on there, particularly things like semantic browser, you don't have to do it from the but for the things in the jigsaw puzzle and the cognitive agent, mm -hmm. right? So, so and, and semantic browser is kind of not actually in the same class as those other things in here, because what I had intended was that those three groups, deductive reasoners, statistical reasoners, predictive 
models, where basically forms of, uh, of, of inference agent, or those were all different in inference agents that would be uh, notified when data, when knowledge is interesting to them, is introduced into the graph that they can react to and produce more knowledge from. So those are all black box, black box functions that you can implement any way you like to extend the knowledge graph based on things that you think are sound, um, sound uh, inference to perform, whether it's, you know, there's a statistical association between these two things because the p-value is low, therefore we're going to put that in there, or uh, you have an NLP process that's going to extract relation, causal relationships that's mentioned in this text. That's all in that thing down there, and those are all being driven by the uh, uh, by the sort of inference agent framework that I built. So you add more agents to that, and there's like a distributed reasoning framework that runs that's that. Forget the semantic class for a moment. So these three uh, jigsaw puzzle pieces, they're the features uh, Basically, the, um, they're different forms of uh, semantic inference agents. Okay, so the semantic inference agents are working on, with, and on a knowledge graph, augmenting it, annotating extending it, it, extending it, potentially putting conflicting information. Yeah, yeah, but then also you could have one, you could have some in there that, that look for inconsistencies and report on them as well. So I, I think I think what um, Kristen is meaning by that, and I don't think of her words in her mouth, but I think she's kind of thinking of that um, different classes of knowledge navigator sort of, like our knowledge enhanced search stuff. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. You know? yeah. I mean, you could view it as a hot tech browser. You could view it as a knowledge enhanced search. Right, well, which are, yeah, so, so the, the high tech browser is a, is a class of knowledge enhanced search. The thing that Alex Schwartzer built is a, for Magellan is a class of knowledge enhanced search. They're, they're just, how, do you, how are you leveraging uh, the ontologies that you know about, um, perhaps inference rules, et cetera, that you have in this, just to um, take advantage of navigating or make that experience of navigating that knowledge graph. To your task, you could view redrucks interface as one of these as well. Yeah. So, so I so that could be um, a knowledge navigator, maybe as a better term. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking that that well, so the browser is a different kind of thing that maybe yes. should not be in that group of four. But but it does, but it sort of makes sense because it connects. So right, there's issues with it because the puzzle pieces also. Well, maybe there's three puzzle pieces below it, and it's across the top of the three puzzle pieces. Well, it, it, it could be viewed as going. So there's a thing going on here, um, but there's because so, so the semantic browsers are essentially so there's three components to Safari that kind of make it a useful thing. Um, there's or three kind of activities around the that make it work just an RDF database. The first one is curation. That's the upper. That's the up top, uh, part of the top. So semantic ETL, um, ma mapping to external resources, uh, doing data import. The second one is the the semantic uh, inference agent framework that extends the knowledge graph based on what's already in there. The third piece is viewing the knowledge graph. And creating semantic, semantically driven, not just visualizations, but views, you know, user interfaces, uh, data APIs that are semantically enabled. Those are the three things that make it more than just, oh, well, what, why don't I just use, uh, why don't I just use Blazegraph by itself? So that feels to me that there's grouping in the top that uh, I'm not positive what we're going to be using. Words you said, mapping and connections. So, this is this problem of this is this is a general picture and a sotoro picture. Right, exactly. Because, and it's you know, so there's some way of looking at this well, is sotoro. You guys and, to do the first pass on the write up of it and then oh, the we got to decide what we're writing up. Well, <laughs> the semantic slant of it because that's what I need first. 
I was thinking, would it make sense to have the cognitive agent, the piece of uh, like digital piece in the cosmetic process? I That's agree. what I think. Yeah. How does all the other agents? Right? Yeah. yeah, and they might be browsing. They might be doing fancy search. They so might be doing all sorts of things. What do you think? Move, move the thing. Cognitive agent uh, instead of uh, cosmetic process because we can have deductive reasoning agent, predictive and modular um, statistical reasoning agent. So because Jim just mentioned that those three. I think switching places. I think the the deductive reasoner, the statistical reasoner, and the predictive model. They're one blob, right. and then there's another blob that might be called a cognitive agent, and it should keep all that other stuff up. System results, right. visualization, and it, it is a browser. It is a, a smart search. Um, it is a visualizer. It is a data journey, but they won't use that phrase. Um, and that. Connects to so your end users. Yeah, I feel yeah, like that sounds good. Let's not use either of those words for now. And I kind of urge them. But, um, so just yeah. to, just to, so are, are we talking about this? Well, I know I mean, it's a good suggestion because it's, you know, because it kind of sits off here. And we yeah, it's the same as the stats. And then maybe the cognitive agent. So we gotta, we gotta, yeah, how do we finish up? So, one example use case we're using semantic data dictionaries for is breast cancer staging, where we're creating semantic data dictionaries for the SEER database to capture um, classes of tumors. Um, based on their tumor size, the number of lymph nodes, and whether or not there's distant metastases. Um, and this is actually the old cancer staging, which will soon be replaced. Yeah, exactly. Which the new one um, does use these anatomical stages, but it also incorporates um, certain receptors like um, the HER2 receptor and the estrogen, estrogen receptor levels. Um, so, What's kind of cool of using the semantic data dictionary for something like this is that we can use the SCD spec to um, annotate this breast cancer staging data from SEER and then um, each of these data variables corresponding to the T value, the N value, and the M value um, will be annotated. So we can then create a rule or an axiom saying that um, any person that has cancer, which has a tumor of these certain characteristics, um, then we can classify that person as having stage X cancer. Um, and what's also um, useful of do, um, doing this kind of rule-based inference of staging is that um, for breast cancer staging, which is changing, once the rule changes, all we have to do is update the axiom to include the new um, characteristics of the rule. Um, so then it'd be just an update of a few lines of code rather than having to re-annotate an entire database. So um, some initial evaluation of this approach was done um, in terms of automatically annotating semantic data dictionaries for the NHANES data set. And this was done by using a uh, web scraping technique um, using the Python Beautiful Soup uh, library. So this web scraping script would um, assign entities and attributes to data columns based on the labels or descriptions of um, the website that it was web scraping, and in this case, it was the web, NHANES website, the NHANES documentation. Um, and essentially, for all 150 documents in the year 2000, 2013, um, we were able to automatically annotate about 24%. And by automatically annotate, I don't mean fully annotate, but it gave us starting points and it assigned an attribute. So 23% um, of 5,000 rows, that's not bad. 
Um, but that means the remaining work is still left for some human to go in and do. And also this automatic extraction method, um, the assigned attributes and entities aren't always correct. So there's also that human creation aspect where you have to go in and check the work. So such a technique um, can be improved by better leveraging natural language processing on the data descriptions. So what was done for this initial work was um, just pattern matching based on certain patterns. If, for example, we saw age, it would map there to SIO age and things like that. So a very naive approach. But um, future work could include leveraging NLP methods to better annotate and more accurately produce significant dictionaries automatically. So, some takeaways. So, the related work you mentioned earlier, could you have used any of those related work to achieve the same thing? Uh, I was wondering if you can have like a benchmark and then make sure you all know what you're saying. Is that possible? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, a lot of the related work. Um, kind of combine this information extraction process as well as the semantic annotation process, which I guess is what I was trying to do here. So that is a good suggestion. I could probably use something like Kim on NHANES and get annotated data. Um, in order to get this accepted, I need to do something. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's fun to get it in a workshop, but in order to get it in a conference or journal, it's got to do something. Mm -hmm. Some comparison against some com some new right. complement. Right. So so that does seem like a, a future direction. But could it could be you know the, the, there could be several aspects of the evaluation. You know, the richness of the of the graph that's generated, the provenance of the graph that's generated, the, um, the, the currency that was the Lotto's precedent the precedent specific to semantic web stack for about 2003. Yeah, well, and actually, I mean, Panera was 2000, um, which did schema mapping. Yeah, and so, merging. so, I mean, we can't run those things today, but we could have a new yeah. off here. So you could hypothesize how it was going to work. But the utilization of current ecologies, all that, all that stuff is a lot of different angles. But, but you're right, you can, you can imagine like a grid of criteria. Right, and I think you're going to have different perspectives. Like, if something did a better job here, but ignored the province. Mm -hmm. If uh, a worse job over there, but uh, used a certain portion here. And then we can, we'll have data to back up why this is such a, if it is. <laughs> but again, it goes into that whole, what we talked about, you know, that sort of those two primary criteria that Jim stated. The usability by a domain. Um, the domain expert and a quality expert mm -hmm. and the quality of the knowledge back that's produced. That could be kind of the mainstays of the evaluation criteria. Right, and we hypothesize that by using the best of the semantics and the best of the natural language and extraction techniques, we can be better than either of the two. Right. And right. we should be able to, if we can't back that up, that would be surprising and, and mm -hmm. publish it. Negative is going to publish it. I think we would be able to do it now. There's so, no thing, just do it. So some takeaways from this evaluation is that human input is still necessary. Um, and that's something I noticed with all of this background work. None of the methods I looked into is fully automated. It's at best semi-automatic where you need some human input to go in there and check the work or <coughs> specify which columns shouldn't go together. And um, so this work also isn't fully automated um, and we might be moving more towards making it um, less user intensive, but um, where we are now, there's always going to be that human um, annotator necessary. Well, it may not be fully automated, but it's highly um, repeatable. Mm -hmm. So once you've done that initial aspect, you know, the human contribution, configure it, You've created a highly repeatable workflow that you can 
be applied. Right. right. That's that's very important. You know, if your if if your source information is not changing that much, you've got to send it to your buyer or you can revise. Right. And like Enhance gets updates every year. So right. one presumes that we can just like very run it. And when we get the new staging criteria for breast cancer, we can rerun against the old criteria and the new criteria. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, as human input is required, it is an ongoing effort um, to manually annotate the remaining of these concepts. Um, I'm starting with a particular year. Once I finish that year, I should be able to extend it to the other years. Um, so I'm starting with 2013, um, but that's a very slow process. Um, however, the SCD specification is being applied to other data sets rather than just NHANES, including um, the genomic data com commons, um, the SEER program, and um, MIMIC, or the medical information mark. So genomic data commons contains data, genomic data, uh, pertaining to um, certain chromosomes. And um, CR program has a lot of demographic information, but the reason we're using it is because um, that data set has breast cancer staging information in it as well. And then um, MIMIC is rich in clinical data in terms of like when patients were admitted, which prescription drugs they took, um, as well as their demographics. So once we annotate all of these um, publicly available data set, um, one thing common to all of these data sets is that they record the demographics of their users. So we'd be able to search these disparate data sets based on certain demographic qualities, like whether they're male or female, um, their socioeconomic level, and things like that. So, um, the knowledge graph that had been created for the subset of um, NHANES is um, actively being used in the data analytics course at RPI. Um, and it's being used to demonstrate to students the power of semantics to help people. Yeah, so um, ju just to wrap up, um, the semantic data dictionary provides a formal means to map data set columns to a compositional structure um, and it allows us to produce IOL based metadata for data sets, um, which includes both explicitly and implicitly defined concepts. Um, it helps address the semantic web goal of interoperability by concentrating on mapping many data sets to a single conceptual structure and using a standard oncology style um, as kind of the general scientific backbone. Um, some automation work has been done, though it's ongoing, um, and that includes web scraping tools such as Beautiful Soup to help semi-automatically populate these semantic data dictionaries. Um, however, human input is required as well as collaboration with domain experts. Is this your conclusion? Yeah. Yeah. In, in general. Yeah. Well, so yeah. so so some projects using the semantic data dictionary are Chair, Case, HBGD, and Tails, and these are some of the um, concepts that are included in the semantic data dictionaries. Um, and in conclusion, so so I guess I did talk about these things in the discussion. So discussion and conclusion can be combined together. Well, yeah, but they need punching.